to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Baptism doth now also save us. First Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. We welcome you today to our study of the purposes of baptism. In this two-part lesson concerning the purposes of baptism, we are now thinking about more information given to us in the scripture that reminds us of the purpose of baptism. What is baptism all about? Why did God command us to do that? And what things do I need to know as I enter into that relationship? We're so glad that you've joined us in our study today. We want you to know that we, we're simply trying to say what the Bible says and encourage others to look to God's Word for all the answers to religious questions. And in part of that, we want you to locate your Bible. If you haven't got your Bible handy, you don't have it with you, take just a moment, locate your Bible, have it ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God to answer the question of the purposes of baptism. Friend, today's lesson, of course, is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit with them, whether it be for worship on Sunday morning or Bible class, a Sunday evening service or Wednesday Bible study, you'll find people at the Lord's Church who love others, who love God, who are warm and kind and would be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. And so check out the Lord's Church in your area. If you've got more you'd like to know on this subject, they'd be happy to study that with you as well as us here at the Gospel of Christ. We want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From that, you can access all of our lessons, both Old Testament books, New Testament books, wide variety of topics, transcripts, study questions, good articles on there as well. Just a wide variety of good Bible study material, and it's all available to you free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of this series on baptism or any of our lessons, you can go to our website, fill out our media request form. We can send that to you digitally as a, a digital download instantaneously, or if you need a DVD or CD, we can make that available to you as well. And as always, check out the Gospel of Christ app in the uh, respective play stores. From that, you can access our information, what we're doing, all of our lessons, receive notifications, and stay up to date with that in our fast-paced world today. In this second part, on the purposes of baptism, we want to emphasize from the Scripture what baptism is all about. Why does God command it? And why does a person need to be baptized? And of course, we begin by noting that baptism is the correct response of faith. It is our, our, our response of faith and expression of faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I want you to open your Bible to a very interesting passage in Colossians chapter 2 where we see what that faith is in. Colossians chapter 2 talks about baptism, but it also mentions something else here. Paul says that we are buried with him, with Jesus, in baptism, in which you are also raised with him, watch this now, through faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. The expression of faith. Why is it that we're baptized into Christ? Why do we think about the death, burial, and how's that tied to all that and, and the forgiveness of sins? All of that is a response of faith in the working of God. Where does salvation take place at? In the mind of God. In God's records, in God's annals, in God's mind. When I obey the gospel, when I submit to what the Bible teaches, I have aligned my will with the will of God, and I'm putting my faith 
in his plan to save me. The plan of his son and his death, burial, and resurrection in obedience to the gospel. I'm putting faith in that. You see, this is what people did in the Bible. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Why did they do that? Because Paul came and preached the death, burial, and resurrection, and they were taught what to do. Galatians 3 verse 27, as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were clothed with Christ. Why did people do that? Because they had faith. It was a true expression of faith in God and His plan to save them. And so baptism, that's where we express our faith in God's plan to, to save us. And it's a true action of our faith. But friend, also realize this. Baptism is an act of my submission to the will of God. I want you to look at a passage that I think is often uh, overlooked as it relates to baptism. Open your Bible, if you would, to Luke chapter 7, and I want you to see something interesting that's mentioned in Luke chapter 7 about those who did not obey God's plan of baptism. Luke 7, verse 29 and 30. And when all the people heard Jesus, even the tax collectors uh, justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But notice this. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves. How did they do that? Having not been baptized by him. If not being baptized is a rejection of the will of God. Now, my friend, we clearly learn that baptism is submission to and acceptance of the will of God. I cannot say I'm being submissive to God, that I recognize God is God, I'm His creation, He's my Father, He's my Creator, He has power and authority over me if I fail to do what He said. It's so interesting what Jesus says or what Luke says. They rejected the will of God for themselves. They said, God, we don't care what you want, we're not doing it. Well, what did they not do? They weren't baptized. When we fail to submit, to God's teaching on baptism, we're rejecting the will of God. When we follow through with that, we are submitting our hearts and our lives, humbly submitting ourselves under Almighty God, bowing down before Him as the true maker of all men. Friend, let's realize this also. We express true repentance when we follow through with God's command to be baptized. Listen to it again. Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If I'm going to change my way of thinking and I'm going to change my way of acting, a changed will that leads to a changed way to follow through with true repentance means I'm going to do what God says and truly let him lead me. I think about Luke chapter 3. Interesting scene takes place here. Looks like everybody is coming out to John to be baptized of him, by him. And so the religious elite, because everybody's doing it, they want to come out as well. And John says to these, these hypocrites, these fakes, John says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Because they had not repented, they couldn't follow that through with baptism. But when we truly repent, we do follow that through by letting our will be made right with the will of God in doing what he says. Acts 3.19, we repent and we turn. It is a 180 degree turn. I'm turning from a life of sin. I'm turning in the direction of God and whatever God tells me to do, including baptism. Friend, I must do that to submit to his divine will and his divine way. All right, what else is baptism all about? Well, part of what we learn about baptism is when I gladly receive God's word into my life, I'm going to be baptized. Uh, I'm not talking about just lip service. I'm not just talking about saying amen or getting excited. When you really gladly receive God's word into your life, you're going to obey the gospel culminating in baptism. Let me show you the example. Open your Bible, if you would, to Acts chapter 2 with me. Now, you remember Acts chapter 2. Peter has preached the gospel to the Jews they realize they've killed the Messiah. They're cut to the heart. They cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. 
And watch what happens in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. This is really amazing. The Bible says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. If I'm going to gladly receive God's word, then friend, I've got to follow that through. If it really brings joy to my heart, if I really understand the message of salvation, that, that Jesus lived a perfect life, that he suffered a horrible death, that he did all of that so that I could have salvation, and that salvation is here and available, and every sin and every wrong I've ever done, I can be free of and I can go to heaven. Friend, if I take that into my heart gladly, the natural response is, those who gladly received his word, those folks were baptized. And friend, we're not, again, we're not just talking about lip service. We're talking about, I'm happy to know I can be free from my sin and there is a way of salvation and whatever God says I've got to do to do it, hey, let's do it. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. Friend, we also learn that baptism is the proper response to hearing the good news of God's kingdom and Jesus Christ. I want you to open your Bible to Acts chapter 8 with me. I want you to see that when we hear about the good news and when we hear about the kingdom of God, the proper response to that is to obey God's plan of salvation in baptism. And so Philip has gone down and preached Christ to them in Samaria. Uh, look what happens when they hear that gladly. The Bible says in verse 12, but when they believe Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Friend, when they, when they heard that good news, when they learned about God's kingdom, the church, that kingdom that would never end, Revelation eleven fourteen, 14, Daniel 2, 44, that kingdom that would one day be in heaven with God, 1 Corinthians 15, 24, when they heard the good news of, uh, of Jesus Christ and, and the, his power to save. Baptism is the proper response to hearing that good news. The people in Samaria, they heard that and they went to the water. They were ready to be baptized and obey God's plan of salvation. Now, my friend, let's consider another very important purpose as it relates to baptism. Oftentimes, I will hear people say, baptism is not essential because Acts 2.21, other places say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord to be saved. And so the Bible says all you got to do is call on the name of the Lord to be saved, and whoever does that, they're going to be saved, and that doesn't say anything about baptism there. My friend, let's ask this. How does the Bible tell us to call on the name of the Lord? Let's let Scripture define what calling on the name of the Lord means. I want you to open your Bible with me, and let's see what it is. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. How do you call on the name of the Lord according to Scripture? Take your Bible, look at Acts 22, verse number 16. Saul has been waiting for a message from God. Ananias comes to him and he says, and now, why are you waiting? Listen to this now. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The picture of calling on the name of the Lord is this. Here's a person who is sinking in the muck and the mire of sin. Here's a person who is headed down the path to destruction and on the highway to hell. And God makes a way of salvation. That person calls on God's name. What's that mean? They call out to God for help. God extends the lifeline in Jesus Christ. And how did Paul call on the name of the Lord? He got up and he obeyed what God said, which included being baptized. Listen to this now. Arise and be baptized, having washed away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, you cannot call on the name of the Lord and leave out what the Bible teaches it means to do that. To call on the name of the Lord means that we get up and do what God says, which includes being baptized to have our sins washed away. Now, friend, I want to drive home a really clear point here. Do you remember 
that God's over here, man's over here, and separating man and God is the problem of sin, right? The Bible says, God is a pure eyes that behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness. Habakkuk 1, verse 12 and 13. Our sins and our transgressions separate us from God. Friend, if that's the case, at whatever moment in time the Bible tells me my sins are washed away, you can know for sure that's when you're saved. When did that happen in Acts 22, 16? Listen to it again. Get up. And be baptized, watch it now, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Sins are washed away in the waters of baptism because that's where we, con it's the death of Jesus that saves, right? It is the, it's the power of his life, death, burial, and resurrection. It's the gospel that saves. And we contact the death of Jesus when we are buried with him in baptism. Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. That's why baptism is associated with salvation because that's the point that we contact the blood of Jesus and his power to save us. Friend, as we mention that idea, I want to illustrate in a really vivid way how that part of the purpose of baptism is it is when you access the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Take your Bible and look in Romans chapter 6. There are two passages that clearly teach this. Open your Bible to Romans chapter 6 with me. And I understand people often say, you're, there's so much emphasis on baptism that you folks don't believe in the death of Jesus. Friend, that is not true. It is the death of Jesus that saves. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness of sins. He tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2 verse 9. We have hope through his death on the cross. 1 Peter 2 verse 24. He's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. And so absolutely, it is the death and the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus that saves. But friend, here's what a lot of people miss. You can't touch you can't access. The death of Jesus does not become spiritually effective for a person until they obey God's plan of salvation in which we contact his death in the waters of baptism. Let me show you that in your Bible. Look in Romans chapter 6, and I want you to begin reading in verse number 1. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, watch this now, we were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him, how? Through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Friend, the person who hasn't been baptized for the right reason, understanding that, hasn't accessed the death of Jesus. Yes, it's his death that saves. When do I contact that death? We are buried with him through baptism into death. You cannot access the death of Jesus that saves by belief alone, by repentance alone. Do I understand you've got to believe, you've got to repent, you've got to confess? Absolutely. But friend, that culminating act by which we contact his death is baptism. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And so hear well on this. Listen carefully. To all the people in the religious world, who say that baptism is not important and baptism is not essential and baptism is not something you do, got to do to go to heaven. Those people have denied, have rejected, and have belittled the death of Jesus. They've done that because they are not teaching what the Bible teaches people have to do to contact his death. You cannot glorify, you cannot magnify the death of Jesus and then fail to teach what Jesus said you've got to do to contact his death. And so to ignore God's teaching, clear teaching on baptism is to be little and demean the death of Jesus and all that that means to salvation. 
And so baptism is how you access the death of our Lord Jesus Christ that saves. What else do we learn happen in that context? In that process, in the context of death, burial, and resurrection, we also learn that we die to sin. How shall we who died to sin continue any longer in it? Do you not know that as many of us as were buried with Christ, we've died to sin? And so when we think about the, the plan of salvation and everything baptism entails, in that process, we die to sin just as well. And that's an important part of what God teaches us to do. And then, my friend, let's realize this. Baptism is important because it's based on the authority of Jesus Christ. Peter commanded them to be baptized, Acts 10, verse 48. Philip commanded them in the name of Jesus to be baptized, Acts 8, verse 16. Peter said, repent and be baptized, listen to this now, in the name of Jesus Christ. What's it mean in the name of? Every time when you read in the Bible something is done in someone's name, it's by their authority. Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Friend, when we do something in someone's name, we're doing it by their authority. And baptism is based not in our authority, not in some other man's authority, not in some religious leader or some catechism's authority. Baptism is based in the name of the Father, the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, or excuse me, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And then, friend, we want to mention two other things that are really important about baptism. Did you know baptism is the point at which you clothe yourself with Christ? You put on Christ, as it were, is the garment you're going to live your life by. Galatians 3.27 says this, As many of us as were baptized into Christ, listen to this phraseology, have clothed ourselves with Christ. When I become a Christian, I'm clothed in righteousness. When I become a Christian, I'm, I'm clothed in that which is good and holy. And we want to try to live according to God's will. We are literally clothing ourselves. We're clothing ourselves with what Christ and Christianity represents, and that's not something you can take off or throw aside easily. And so baptism clothes us with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But now, my friend, hear the clearest language of all about God's purpose on baptism. I want you to open to 1 Peter chapter 3. This is such a, a clear passage that you have to have help to misunderstand it. Look in 1 Peter chapter 3 and notice the clarity with which God speaks in verse 21. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. The comparison is how those who got on the ark were saved by water because the boat was lifted up by the water, the same water that destroyed some, saved Noah and his family. They were saved by water and the boat lifted them up and saved them. Uh, and then verse 21 says this, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or as the King James Bible says, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, if God wanted to if God wanted to make it any clearer, how could he do that? If God wanted to make it crystal clear and explicit as possible that baptism is essential to salvation, how would he say it? Well, he'd probably say something like, baptism does now save us. 1 Peter 3.21. That is as clear and as plain a language as we can make it. And Peter explains it's not the removal of the filth of the flesh. Well, again, the baptistry, we're not washing sin off our body. That's not the idea. What is it? It's the answer of a good conscience. What's that mean? God said to do it. When I have faith in God, I have to answer properly by doing it. And all of that is based on the hope and the joy of the resurrection. Again, Romans 6, 1 through 4. Died of sin, buried with him in baptism, raised up out of that to walk in newness of life. And so, friend, I understand that you may have heard that probably a lot of folks maybe even have said this, and you've maybe seen or read or heard people say 
that yes, Jesus was baptized and you ought to follow his example, but no, baptism is not essential to salvation. Baptism is not something you have to do. It is not for the forgiveness of sins. I hope that in our last two lessons, you've seen what the scripture says, where Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38, where Jesus said, baptism saves. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Where Paul said, baptism is where we are buried with Christ into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4, and where the apostle Peter kind of summed it all up by saying, baptism does now also save us. Not alone, combined with hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, combined with true faith and belief and commitment in Jesus as the Savior, John 8, verse 24, combined with a, a willingness to turn from sin and turn to God in repentance, Acts 3, verse 19, making that good confession just like the Ethiopian eunuch did, Acts 8, verse 36 and 37, we bring all that to a head and our faith is put into action when we are buried with Christ in baptism by faith in the working of God to raise us from that. Colossians 2 verse 12. And so friend, we ask you today, have you done what the Lord teaches? How, do you know the truth first? And has that truth made you free? Maybe you didn't know some of these things. Maybe you didn't know any of these things. Nothing wrong with not knowing. But once you learn the truth, Friend, we need to obey that and do what God says. And so if we can help you, the local church in your area, Church of Christ in your area can help you. Let us know, let them know. And we hope, my friend, that you'll join us next time as we study more on this great subject of what does God teach about baptism. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.